Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Everybody can hear me? Okay. <clears throat> um, this morning, we'll start the lesson with a riddle. I'll read it through twice, and maybe by the end of this, the end of this lesson, uh, we'll come back to that riddle. If someone has not answered it, Surrey. So, <laughs> uh, I don't know. This is one, it took me a moment. I'm going, hmm. So, this is the riddle. I'm a restless evil full of poison. A match in a forest. The rudder on a ship. An untrustworthy fountain. A horse's bit. As a fig tree, I can produce olives. As an olive tree, figs. I can ruin everything. I'm in the Bible. What am I? You want me to read that again? Okay. I'm a restless evil full of poison. A match in a forest, the rudder on a ship, an untrustworthy fountain, a horse's bit. As a fig tree, I can produce olives, and as an olive tree, figs. I can ruin everything. I'm in the Bible. What am I? I'm not going to let you answer. <laughs> I want people to think about this. Okay? Because it has everything to do with what we've been studying on. And the studies, just in case, for those of you who haven't been here, is uh, BC had asked me to give a series of lessons on what are the fundamentals of being a Christian, the basics of being a Christian. Okay? And I think uh, I've, I've given him more than he intended for me to, to do. But the more I dug into this, the more I realized just how ignorant I was of why I'm a Christian. Okay? So you might pose this question to yourself again. I've asked this before, and, and this is partly a review, but partly for people who haven't been here before. Why are you a Christian? Some benefit to it? What drove you to being a Christian? Well, does anybody remember where we started this study? Chapter 1, written by Solomon. Proverbs. Proverbs 1. So if you would, turn to Proverbs 1. And I read from the New American Standard. It reads like this. Proverbs 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Now look at the first two words there. To know. Not N-O, but to K-N-O-W. Okay? To know wisdom and instruction. To discern the sayings of understanding. What have we been studying? What have we been doing since I've started this? Trying to dig into the discerning and the saying of understanding. Okay? Verse 3. To receive instruction in wise behavior. Righteousness, justice, and equity. Verse 4. To give prudence to the naive. To the youth, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. And a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and 
They're riddles. Hence the reason for giving a riddle when we start these lessons. And this one this morning, hopefully you've had a little bit of time to think a little deeper into that. Verse 7. And I consider this a real heavy hitter in all of Scripture. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I didn't say the end or the middle part. It just says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And I wanted to add this last bit here in verse 8. Okay, because we've gone far, we've gone far enough along in this study. I think it's beneficial for us to add this. How many of us in here are parents? Okay, verse eight: Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. How many of you in here had a father that was not necessarily a Christian? My father may have named it kind of. His instructions were kind of based out of the Bible, but did my dad really live it that way? I don't know. Don't know. From the outward signs of it, dad's going to have a rough time in judgment. Okay? So you as a parent, you're going to be held responsible for the way you raised your kid? Or did you just boot them out the door when they was about five years old and said, go find your own way? Sometimes that's what happens. As soon as kids get into school, ah, I don't have to do anything anymore. From eight to three, let them, let them do whatever they want. Come home, I'll stuff some supper in their face and put them to bed, watch a TV. And that goes for mothers and fathers. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Well, my mom was much more instructive about that, okay? And I say these things because I want you to put yourself in the same place I'm putting myself. How was I instructed on this? And to be perfectly honest, out of all the, the parenting that I had, my grandmother on the Kelly side, that was my mom's maiden name, was the most instructive. She's the one that got me to actually start reading the Bible. So just because you're a grandparent doesn't mean that you should shirk your responsibility of your grandkids. So, the next piece that we read, if you'll turn over to John, the Gospel of John, in chapter 1. <clears throat> I'm just doing this kind of as a quick review here before we dive into what we're, what we're going to cover. And the header on this, it says the gospel according to John, and the header on this says the deity of Jesus Christ. So chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Remember, I gave a series of lessons on darkness. And one of the things I tried to stick in your mind was the blue dot. Does anybody remember anything at all about the blue dot? Tom? Anybody else remember the blue dot? Well, I suggest to you that you look up, just use a search engine and look up something called the blue dot. And it'll bring up a picture of the earth taken... Gosh, this is in the 1990s. Carl Sagan, a scientist, urged NASA to do this. They turned the camera around, found Earth, and at a distance, I've forgotten how many billions of miles it is. It's a long, long ways. But there's this minuscule little blue dot in the vast expanse of all this space. And the reason for this is because I asked the question, between that blue dot and that camera, what was there? 
Is there anything? We, we tend to think in, about space as, is there anything in space? And you think about the word space, period. Which if you're like me, you start thinking, well, how in the world did we develop this language to be able to understand things in the first place? Where did that come from? We don't even give it a second thought, do we? Where does thought come from? Well, the point behind this is there's a whole bunch of, bunch of human units in this room right now, and it's amazing that we all function the same way, isn't it? We may not think the same way, but we function the same way. Well, who designed that? What are we talking about in 1 John here? Or John, John 1, the first chapter? The Creator. We get all philosophical about this and go, well, what in the world did he create the earth for in the first place and everything out there? What purpose is it? Well, believe it or not, the Bible tells you. Anybody in here want to stick their hand up and tell, tell me what my thought is on that? I've hammered enough of you with this idea for a long time. You should be able to tell me. It's a one, it's one word. It runs throughout Scripture. Even Jesus was called this, this word. The servant. Purpose. What's our purpose? Purpose comes down to, can you be trusted? Trusted servant. What's the one, who's the one human being that could have been trusted, without a doubt? Jesus. He lived a perfect life. And what did human beings do to him for it? They murdered him. So, with all of this, we're coming to this fundamental. <clears throat> and I have to ask this question here. I wrote this down, and it's a sentence and then the question. A professing follower of the way, a Christian, was once living their life in darkness. Anybody in here want to argue about that? What is or was the root cause for a person to come out of the darkness? What caused you to come out of that darkness? What surrounded you? When I say darkness, are we talking about living in a closet with the absence of photons? In other words, absence of light. You were in space inside that cabinet. What is it that made you come out of the darkness? Well, yeah, yeah. But what makes you aware of this? How do you know you're in the darkness? Some people just go through life just sailing along. The Bible teaches it, doesn't it? Okay. But what taught it before the Bible? So, we go, we go to the third chapter in Genesis. You will not die. What kind of darkness was that? See, we get into these definitions of things, and then we've got to be careful, because how many words do you, do you know of that have carry like duality or even triple meanings for them? But darkness... What is this darkness that's being referred to? What did I just refer to with Eve saying to herself, I won't die. Innocence was there, wasn't it? So we were in the light, right? But then the game changer is she took it upon herself 
to serve who? Herself. Straight into darkness. Because if you're in the presence of the Creator, how much more proof do you need? And then you want to buck up against the Creator when He specifically told you things not to do? One simple thing. Don't touch that. And I always I have to always throw this in. When God found out, and He came, and who did He go to talk to? Who talked to first? The man. What was His sorry excuse? She made me do it. She didn't make you do anything, bud. What does it come down to here? Darkness. I'll reread the question. What is or was the root cause for a person to come out of the darkness? Sin? How do you know what sin is? Huh? The Bible tells us, doesn't it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, let's use an illustration of what, what, is, what is wrong. Let's say you've got uh, a nice, new, shiny automobile sitting in the driveway, and you left the key in it, even if it's one of these electronic keys. You come out to get in your car the next morning, and your car is gone. And you have video camera that shows some young person, or just use a young person, walks up and steals it from you. Well, what's wrong with that? What was wrong with them stealing your stuff? Anything? Wrong. What makes it wrong? Let's get to the essence of why we think this way. Knowing that it's wrong? The knowledge of right yeah. and wrong. Yeah. Well, whose, whose possession was that in the first place? Get down to brass tacks on this. It's your stuff, isn't it? Shouldn't you have the ability to tell someone, yes, I will give it to you, or I will donate it, or you can use it, rather than just having a thief in the night come along and just take it from you? Go back to... The garden. You will not die. Who stole from who here? She said you stole from God. Who did Eve, who did Eve actually steal from? Herself. So, if you would, let me pose another question here. Well, let me go back to the first one here. What is or was the root cause for a person to come out of the darkness? The first thing is they realize they're in the dark. Well, how do they know that? Well, we've answered with the Bible. We've been given a set of rules, so to speak. Things to do, things not to do. So, we get to this next part. And it's right there at the very end of Proverbs where it said, the fear of the Lord. Wait a minute. I'm not supposed to be taking someone else's stuff. What happens when some guy steals his friend's wife? That does happen, doesn't it? What did David do when he looked down at Bathsheba? It drove him to the point of having someone else murder for him, didn't it? An innocent man that didn't, knew, didn't know anything about what was going on. How devious can a human being become? Are we bulletproof to that? He 
turned into a devious, in, devious individual because why? He, who was he afraid of? Well, not necessarily. Who was he really afraid of finding out about what had gone on between him and Bathsheba? Huh? Uriah. Why was David afraid of Uriah? Because he had done the wrong thing and he knew it. He was guilty of it. What does sin supposed to do to us? Other than it makes a slave of us in one direction, right? Think about this. This is the root cause of where we're at here. This is the reason why something called grace has been given to us. Because who in here has lived a sin-free life? I'll tie my hands behind my back. I can't hold my hands up. So again, we come back to this thing here. I've written it down as a question. Was it fear? You're living in the darkness and you come to find out maybe a litany or just maybe one or two things you've been doing in your life are not the right things to be doing. So if we ask the question, what is fear? What is fear? Well, let's look at the dictionary and see what it says. Well, before we look in the dictionary, we'll look in the New American Standard. That's what I'm reading from. The word occurs 383 times. In the updated version from 1995, it occurs 385 times. In the English Standard Version, it occurs 437 times. In the, in the, uh, the American, just the old American Standard, which was published around 1900, it occurs 487 times. In the NI, well, let's see, in the... Uh, uh, the both, both versions of, of King James is 501 times, and then in the New International Version, it occurs 336 times. So fear is a word that, you know, it's, it's pretty well entrenched into Scripture, right? So here, here's the definition of it. Fear when it's used as a noun. That's a person, place, or a thing, Okay. An unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. What did it say in Proverbs 1? Let's go back to it and look at it and read it again. Make sure we get it right. By the way, BC, I still have this thing here. You'd requested we give it back. You've got to tell me whether I need to give it, give it back to you or not. Anyway... Verse 7, he says, the fear of, not, of the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And in addition to it, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, are you wise to keep wandering around in the dark? And I've illustrated it like this. How many of us have walked through the living room in the dark, going to go get a drink out of the refrigerator or something, you're barefooted and you accidentally slam your toe as you take a stride into the edge of a coffee table. How hard did you hit that coffee table? You might be walking at all of maybe three miles per hour. You'll come to find out what an object in motion, when it hits us, an object that cannot be moved, what kind of damage can happen to your foot. It hurts, doesn't it? What do you think here is being said about wisdom and your fear of what are you doing? What are you doing? I ask myself that question on a regular basis. You idiot, what do you think you're doing here? You know? So, the next thing about fear, definition, is anxious concern, solicitude. Well, I had to make sure on solicitude because it made me immediately it made me think about something. And let me give you the definition of solicitude. The state of being concerned and anxious. Solicitude. Well, I thought about an episode of the Twilight Zone. It's just called The Lonely. And it's a story about a man who committed murder or he was accused of committing murder. He said he was innocent, but he was 
his deal was, and remember this is the Twilight Zone back in the 1950s, early 60s, he was sentenced to live 50 years on an asteroid by himself. Not another human being on the planet or asteroid. You stop for a second and think about it. You know, this is the proverbial man on the island with no one around. Castaway, if you will, if you think about the movie. Total solicitude. Who can you talk to? Do you talk to Wilson, the volleyball, from the movie? What if you don't even have the volleyball to talk to? Total solicitude. Back to the, what the definition of that says, anxious concern, solicitude. Our anxious concern before we became Christians. Number three in the list of definitions of this is reason for alarm, danger. Flashing red light. Don't go through this, stop, don't go through this intersection unless you stop first. Red lights, alarm, right? Number four, profane reverence and awe, especially towards God. Not profane, but profound. Sorry. That was one of the things that occurred to me when I was a kid. And I haven't thought about this too much until just recently. Do you remember, for those of us who have been baptized for a long time ago, what was one of your prime movers in becoming a Christian? think you're going to get rich? Most of the Christians I've known in my lifetime are not very rich. But what is it? What is that fear? Or does death scare you? Because there's something that happens along the way from you transitioning from being a kid to an adult. And all of a sudden, you start to become aware of this house you live in is going to come to an end. Does anybody remember the first time you heard anything about God? I can hazily remember getting my backside paddled outside of the front step on the church. I heard about it, but it was meaningless to me. But when you talk to someone about God, do you sound like you're just talking gibberish to them? Or can you carry on a reasonable explanation for what is going on here? I've said it before, and I'll say it again. One of the things that I've found that has become very helpful in speaking to people in your discipleship is to make them aware of who they are, what they are, what am I? Why am I standing up here? Why is BC going to get up and speak in a little while? Who gives prayers? What are you doing? Part of it is serving self, isn't it? But serving self to a purpose for a higher power? To demonstrate to who? To the people around you? What about to the constant? When I say the constant, are you kind of looking over your shoulder when you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and there's no one else around? Is your mind playing that trick on you? Let me ask you this question. What's the first time you ever recognized fear? I had to think about this for a few minutes before I remember it. I'm not talking about getting your backside paddled, but I mean genuinely fear. I'll give you two instances. When I was a little boy, uh, we lived just maybe a quarter mile down the road from my grandparents. We lived in a little wooden house that was full of wind and dirt. My grandfather Roberts lived in a real nice house. And um, I think you've even been by it, haven't you? BJ? Remember, y'all stopped on the side of the road and y'all saw that. It didn't look like that when I was a kid, but it looked a lot better. But nevertheless, 
I had this vague feeling. I remember I had this kind of a fear of being left alone. Well, one day, apparently, I'd fallen asleep in the middle of the afternoon, which is a rare occurrence for me. I hated taking naps. I got up, and there was no one in the house. And I had this extreme fear that I had been abandoned. Have you ever had that happen to you before? Can you imagine being abandoned and there's no one around to help you, especially when you're a little kid? That one gave me the fear. The next time I got a fear was watching an episode of The Twilight Zone called Terror at 20,000 Feet, Odessa, Texas. Me and my mom laying on the couch. I was laying right there in front of my mother. I was probably, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, somewhere in that neighborhood. And if any of you have seen the episode, uh, there's a gremlin playing on an airplane wing when they're flying at, at 20,000 feet. And this guy's imagination, which is the actor was William Shatner, he keeps thinking about it and thinking about it, and he'll open the curtain and close the curtain on the window. And by the way, he had just gotten out of a mental institute. So me and my mom are all wrapped up watching this thing, and he whips open that thing, and that thing's face was right there. They took up the whole screen, and I, my mother, straightened out like a, just, and I did too, and I felt a bolt go from my head, and it felt like it hit the bottom of my foot and came straight back up. Anybody ever had a sense of fear like that? That was an actual physical reaction to fear. I've had a few others just before I hit the side of a car going around 100 miles an hour. No. That was my only reaction. Grab the brake and go, no. Absolute fear. I know this, that the week before I was baptized, I sat there, and that's all I could think about. I hope I don't die before I'm baptized. Fear. So we're getting down to one of the fundamentals here about this, of being a Christian. I suggest to you whether or not you did, have, did or did not have fear, the realization of it, that's something as a disciple we need to make people aware of. Do you know the condition you're, you're in? That one of these days you're going to face the one that created you, and there will be a judgment call on you. And you can get into the explanation about what judgment's for. And again, are you, are you or are you not a worthy servant? Because God repeatedly says, I don't want, I can't have an unworthy servant around me. Oh, absolutely, it's scary. Yeah, yeah. Anybody that's had to come close on things like that, that's. But how scary is it to you when you read Scripture about your very existence? Let's just say hell is just you're winked out of existence because you're an unworthy servant. Well, we'll stop there. We'll cover this a little bit more next week. But this is one of the things that I think is a fundamental that hopefully you can use this as one of your weapons in the quiver, so to speak, when you speak to those about Christ. Now, back to the riddle. Let me read it one more time here. And then I'll give you places to read in Scripture that will cover this. <clears throat> I am a... I am a restless evil, I am restless, I am a restless evil full of poison. A match in a forest, the rudder on a ship, an untrustworthy fountain, a horse's bit. As a fig tree, I can produce olives. As an olive tree, 
figs. I can ruin everything. I'm in the Bible. What am I? What is he talking about here? Tongue, she says, tongue? What controls the tongue? Muscles. What tells your muscles what to do? Read the first chapter of James, then go over and read the third chapter of James. And don't just race through it. Read it for understanding. You're pointing? B.C. was pointing over here? Oh, Alistair. Tongue? Okay. Well, again, I pose that question. What controls your tongue? This is what God's after right here. You were going to say tongue? Oh, mind? Okay. Yeah, because you got to think about this. Who's in control of your mind? Who is you in the first place? Have you ever figured out who is you, who is me? David Davis over there doesn't control my mind. Neither does BJ or anybody else in here. I control this. This is what James teaches you in the first chapter and the third chapter. He covers it. Maybe next week we'll read the third chapter out loud and go through it. If I've said anything and it's an error, anything that you have a question about, please let me know. Does anybody have the answer to the riddle? James. Yeah, John, James tells you in the first chapter of James who's doing the thinking and who's making the choice. No one makes that choice but you. Free will. Free will. Who controls free will? You're supposed to. But if you listen to that riddle, what are humans doing? Sometimes we think about self and well anyway hopefully I've armed you with food for thought about our behaviors and the ultimate price we pay for our behaviors okay thank you